The material that you're about to listen to and engage with came from our 2017 Missiology Lectures when myself, along with my colleague Johnny Ramirez Johnson, said we need to do this next 2017 Missiology Lectures on this topic of race theology mission. And we invited Dr. Love Seacrest to engage with us in that process. We wanted to explore the challenging questions regarding racism and ethnocentrism and xenophobia and all of those issues from the perspective of world Christianity with regard to how these realities have existed in many parts of the world and also as part of the colonial mission endeavors. It is fascinating to think that the realities we were talking about are not the experiences of one individual or even one society. We're talking about whiteness as a way of defining the world. And the conference and the conference presenters address time and again this epistemology, this way of making meaning. It has also been described as colonization and post-colonization. The question is not, it's not about guilt, it's about engagement. It's about what are we going to do with what we have inherited. Uh, so the fact that we're having the conversation should not point a finger at you as a listener or viewer. But these are hard conversations. Um, the conversation about race is one that has been deferred for so long and so often, over and over again, as soon as we get close to having a meaningful conversation about race, um, we recoil from the pain of it. And so in our lectures, there are, you'll see some of that pain emerge. You'll see some people who have long experienced racism uh, express and, de and declare and name experiences that they um, have had that have been deeply formative, deformative even. So this conversation is not a pretty one, but we're having it. As observers, as uh, listeners, you will be engaging and we invite you to invite the Holy Spirit. The three of us pray a lot about this series. Mm -hmm. We humbly submit it to God and plead it for God's mercy to lead us. We are feeble and combined, we are imperfect, and we have prayed that the Lord will fill the gaps. And the conversation is only a starter. It is in your hands. It is in your community. It is in your family. And most importantly, it is on your knees. Mm. So, sisters and brothers, a, a question this evening, a question for us this evening. Can white people be saved? Can white people be saved? For some, the question that titles this presentation sounds deeply offensive. It suggests that there is a category of people whose existence raises the question of the efficacy of salvation. The efficacy of salvation, as you all know, is a very complicated theological ideal involving not just one's status in eternity, as many great evangelists would say, but also the quality and character of one's Christian commitment. And not only these matters, but also the nature of the redemptive dynamic of a life. That is, the level of depth of one's deliverance from captivity or bondage. Now, at this moment, at this moment, I am less concerned about the efficacy of salvation with the question and more concerned, more interested in the status of two key words, salvation and whiteness, salvation and whiteness. These terms point to a history that we yet live within, a history where whiteness as a way of being in the world has been parasitically joined 
to a Christianity that is also a way of being in the world. It was the fusion of these two realities that gave tragic shape to Christian faith in the new worlds at the dawn of what we now call mo the modern colonialist era, or as scholars like to call colonial modernity. It is precisely this fusing together of Christianity with whiteness that constitutes the ground of many of our struggles today. The struggle against aggressive nationalism is the struggle against the fusion of Christianity and whiteness. The struggle against racism and white supremacy and some aspects of sexism and patriarchy is the struggle against this fusion. The struggle against the exploitation of the planet is bound up in the struggle against this joining. So many people today see these problems of planetary exploitation, of racism, of sexism, of nationalism, and so forth, but they do not see the deeper problem of this, this fusion, which means they have not yet grasped the energy that drives many of our problems. We have always had difficulty in seeing the deeper problem of this fusion. On the one hand, many people have not been able to see this as a fusion, a joining that should have never happened. Many people collapse Christianity and whiteness into just one thing, loved or hated. They cannot see two things, two mutually interpenetrating realities, the one always performing itself inside the other, always performing itself inside the other. On the other hand, there are just as many people who do not see this as a deep problem or even as a problem at all. They have made whiteness an irreversible accident of history or even dare I say, an attribute of creation. That whiteness is a problem remains an elusive point to get across because too many people have no idea what to do with such an idea. Beside bewilderment, bewilderment the typical responses I get to the idea that whiteness is a problem is a mixture of guilt and anger and, of course, the inevitable pushback. I want to return to these important emotions a little later. It is an ironic truth of Christian faith that most people perform a faith, embody a faith, far more complex than they articulate. There, sisters and brothers, is a vastness, a vastness to our faith, our lives in faith that we cannot adequately capture with our words. And the difficulty with racial existence and with whiteness in particular is that it is woven itself into that vastness. Seeing, make, making seeing the fusion and seeing our way beyond the fusion very difficult work. So my presentation aims to aid us in the work of ending the fusion of whiteness and Christianity. To speak of whiteness, to speak of whiteness is not to speak of particular people, but of people caught up in a deformed building project aimed at bringing the world to its full maturity. What does maturity look like? Maturity of mind and body, land and animal use, landscape and building, family and government. Whiteness, whiteness, my sisters and brothers, is a horrific answer to this question formed exactly at the site of Christian missions. So in this presentation, I want to explore whiteness as a deformed formation toward maturity. Whiteness as a deformed formation toward maturity and along the way to consider some of its effective, its emotional dimensions. 
And finally, at the very end, since I don't have much time, finally at the very end to suggest how we might begin to separate whiteness from Christianity by forming places, forming places, concrete places that offer a different building project toward maturity. But before we turn to these matters, let me raise a couple of questions that some will want addressed right away. I've done this before. <laughs> First question, first question everybody asks. Have I already made whiteness too important? Made matters of racial identity too decisive? This is a fair question. If it is asked from a position where the history and the continuing influence of the West and of Christianity has only been and continues to be tangential at best. If, but if I am inside the story of modern Christianity, then I am inside the story of racial identity. And if I am inside a faith confessed or a social and economic order performed that echoes down the centuries from the colonial shores and, or homes of the masters of the old world of Europe, then I am inside the story of whiteness, whether I know it or see it or not. Another related question often asked at this moment is whether a focus on whiteness obscures the voices and visions of all those people designated non-white, especially designated black. Does focusing on whiteness, does focusing on whiteness continue the tragic history of making the minds, actions, and decisions of Europeans and their descendants central to our imaginations and our actions? In short, does this focus continue to undermine non-white agency, both historically and existentially? This, too, is a fair question if it is asked with a view toward the struggle of so many peoples in the world right now to be heard and taken seriously. But if we want to understand what finding voice and forming life-sustaining vision means at this moment, then we have to understand how whiteness informs the intellectual art artistic, economic, and geographic stage on which vision and voice are realized and performed. Moreover, my sisters and brothers, both these important questions have not yet reckoned with the reality of creaturely entanglement. We have always lived in an enmeshed world where lives are intertwined and constantly and continuously interweaving. It was and is a mistake. It was and is a mistake to ever imagine separate but equal existence. Don't drink that poison. It is one thing to imagine the voice and vision of a people being heard and seen. It is an entirely different matter to imagine voice and vision existing alone, singularly, or in competition with other voices. Even if it could be imagined in the past, it certainly cannot be and should not be imagined now. Yet even in the past, Separate existence was never realized as sequestered existence. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. Wow. We are joined at the site of the dirt. Yes. And the dirt, the dirt is our kin. The dirt is our kin. From dust we came, and from to dust we will return. We are of the dirt, the dirt. Even geographic distance and the difference of strange tongues cannot thwart this truth. We are creatures bound together. But it was precisely this recognition and the historic resistance to it that showed itself so powerfully in the emergence of whiteness. Whiteness as we now know it and experience it emerged at a moment in human history 
when the world in all its epistemological density was opening up to those we would later call Europeans. It began simply as an impulse. Early Europeans entered worlds overwhelming in every way, not only the majestic beauty, but also the stunning landscapes, not just the inexplicable animals in their mind-bending variety, but the vast array of different languages carried by different peoples, different peoples, similar but different. These early Europeans in these new places asked themselves the question, who am I in this strange new place? Who am I in this strange new place? This is the right question. This is the right question, the holy and good question. It's the question you should always ask when you're in a new place. Who am I in this new place? The newness of place should always invoke such questions. The question is never the root of selfishness. Selfishness grows from its answer. These early Europeans answered the question without the voice and vision of the peoples of the new world. They self-designated. They self-designated. That was bad enough, but the horror continued as they designated vast numbers of remarkably different peoples. As they did this, they quickly began to suture different peoples, clans, tribes into racial categories. They, the Europeans, were white, and the others almost white, not quite white, non-white, or almost black, not quite black or black. They also created a virile world of designation, a virile world of designation between white and black. It's never just about white and black. White and black are the frames within which you can designate others. Between white and black, capable of capturing all people in racial identity. What began, we should say, we should say, as harmless designating soon took its place in a matrix of harm. In that matrix of harm, these categories took on an aggressive life of their own. As I had noted elsewhere in print, the work of proto-Europeans naming themselves white and others non-white was only one side of what constituted racial identity. The other crucial part of that constitution was the formation of private property. The formation of private property and the destruction of place-centered identities. Race and place have always been together. For the first time in human history, peoples, especially in the colonized worlds, would be forced to think themselves in disorienting ways, to think themselves away from land and away from animals and into racial encasement, into races. They were forced to reduce their identities down to their bodies and the activities of their body. Why? Because the land was being taken. The animals were being captured and killed at a monstrous rate. And the plants and the landscape were being altered irreversibly. These Christian settlers understood themselves to be present in the new worlds only by the hand of God, only through God's ineffable providence. They were there for one central purpose, one central purpose, to bring the new worlds to maturity, mature use, mature development, and of course, a mature perception of the world. As the taking of land and animal was being done, European Christians challenged to its core the vision shared by many native peoples and those, the many, many peoples that both their identities and their sense of well-being formed and flourished through constant interaction with specific places and animals. They were not simply in a place and with animals. They were not simply on land. The place was in them, and they were within the animals, sharing life and vision, joined together as family. Such a vision for most missionaries was demonically inspired confusion. 
later in time to be called by others animism, and still later to be called cultural primitivism. In place of this vision, in place of this vision, the real one, the one closer to the truth, these Christians installed the conceptual building block we live in to this day. That is, of a world that revolves around a centered white self, a body that projects meaning onto the world, onto land and animals, through reductive forms of naming, designating, classifying, analyzing, and summarizing the nature of being and the beings of nature. There was a central reason for the emergence of the new self, a central reason for the emergence of the new self. It was necessary in order to bring nature and human beings to maturity, to the full realization of their purpose and their use. So the pedagogical goal of missionaries and others was not simply to bring new world peoples into the reality of salvation, but as fundamental to their salvation to change their ways of seeing the world so that they too would see themselves as rightly centered, rightly centered selves who project meaning onto the world and who may bring nature to its full purpose and use. This crucial educational hope was to disabuse native peoples of any idea that their lands and their animals, landscapes and seasons carried any communicative or animate density. Another way to say that is that they wanted to disabuse them of the idea that the world speaks and that they have to listen. And therefore, if the world speaks and we have to listen, there might be ethical and moral direction for how to live in the world. If the world speaks, if the world speaks, and we're able to listen. If God has placed in the world a voice, and we have to listen. Instead, they offered peoples a relationship with the world that was basically one-dimensional. We interpret and manipulate the world as we see fit, taking from it what we need, and caring for it only within the logics of making it more productive for us. That is, we draw the world into its proper fulfillment. Now, this is crudely put, but it captures the trajectory of how humanity's imperial position as stewards of the creation was most often interpreted in colonial contexts. The whole world in this way of thinking was framed temporally, always in need of being moved from its potential to its full realization, potentiality to actuality, as Thomas put it. This way of perceiving the world, as the great Native American religious scholar Vine Deloria Jr. said, it drained the world of its spatial realities, drained the spatial realities of life of any real significance. Native peoples, he said, were forced to think their lives temporally and not spatially. The Western Christianity they received taught them this crucial lesson that you and I have accepted as gospel truth. Where you live temporally, that is, where you are going, moving, developing toward, is far more important than where you were spatially. That is, where you lived, where you live now, or with what people, animals, plants, or landscape you share. In fact, the latter is utterly inconsequential. The most important thing in the world in this Christianized way of thinking is to allow yourself to be moved toward maturity. It is precisely this commitment to a life aimed at maturity that joined visions of salvation to ideas of the transformation of lands and peoples. Whiteness, sisters and brothers, whiteness formed at this joining. From the beginning of colonialism, salvation and the transformation of land and people have been coupled together, and that coupling turned Christianity's creative powers against itself. Christian faith is about new life in Christ and forming life inside that newness. That is the truth. We know that, right? Amen. Now the new situation of colonial power enfolded the newness that is Christian faith. 
within the newness that was the transformation of land and people, earth and animal. Now we need precision here to see the problem. The problem is not that things change. Things change. We could even say, we could even say, things evolve. Nor is the problem the impulse to transform. Transformation is not inherently evil. The horror here is the denial of voice and vision of people who inhabit place in ways that deny the logics of life together in a place as the basic wisdom that should form shape, that should form change and transformation. The horror here is the emergence of a form of creating that destroys creation. A form of creating that destroys creation. This is not the logic of breaking eggs to make omelets. <laughs> that is, recognizing that some destruction is always inherent in creation. Th that's not the logic here. The logic here destroys the life of chickens by distorting their bodies to maximize egg production. This logic drives creation toward death. So this is where we are. Death began with denying the voice of peoples and the voice of the earth. That is the earth's own semiotic reality. And in doing this to render people's identities bound to place inconsequential. Death expanded its reach through designating peoples and the earth in reductive categories, isolating lives and life into fragments in order to make them more useful. That is, to turn everything into commodities. We were then taught to project meaning onto our lives and to life itself now formed in fragments. And we learn to reassemble life as interchangeable, exchangeable, and connectable bodies, buildings, goods, and services. Yeah. Yeah. This is us. Yeah. And we have remained on this trajectory, and it set in place the processes of transformation that captured the energy and logic of Christian conversion and placed it inside whiteness as a formation toward maturity. So if you have not followed this, let me state it clearly. No one is born white. Do not tell children that. No one is born white. There is no white bi biology. But whiteness is real. Whiteness is a working, a forming toward a maturity that destroys. Whiteness is an invitation to a form of agency and a subjectivity that imagines life progressing toward what is, in fact, a diseased understanding of maturity, a maturity that invites us to evaluate the entire world by how far along it is toward this goal. White agency and subjectivity, whiteness, forms as people imagine themselves being transformed and moving toward maturity in three fundamental ways. Being, moving from being owned to being an owner, from being a stranger to being a citizen, and from being identified with darkness to being seen as white. Now, it should be clear at this point it should be clear at this point that anyone can enter white agency and white subjectivity. That is, anyone can be white, friends. Anyone can be white. Anybody can step on the path, the trajectory toward whiteness. Whiteness is not exclusive. It is inclusive. Come one, come all. We can all be white. Now, if I had time, I would go into more details about the three trajectories, but my time is coming to an end. So, my time is coming to an end. So, let, let, me, let, me, let me press on then 
and then when, I, when, when, we, when we get these published, you'll be able to see the more details. But, <laughs> but let me press on to the, the, the reality of this, the feeling of whiteness. You see, the difficulty we face at this moment is the success of this work. Whiteness feels normal and natural. It feels normal and natural because it is woven into how we imagine moving toward maturity. Whiteness, of course, right now, as many of you know, is being questioned at this moment like never before. And it feels terrible to so many people. We have to talk about how whiteness, we have to talk about whiteness in relationship to affect and feeling because how whiteness feels is how whiteness thinks. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. How whiteness feels is how whiteness thinks. Agency and subjectivity form in how we feel and think as one reality of personhood. So the questioning of whiteness feels terrible in two ways to many people. First, it feels as if we are abandoning the goal of progress. And secondly, it feels as if we are becoming obsessed with matters of identity and loss and losing um, uh, matters of identity and we've lost a sense of common purpose. It feels as if we are abandoning the goal of progress because we have been led to believe that the way life has formed over the colonial centuries is the only viable way that remains open to us. Some argue strongly that the denial of indigenous primitivisms, the necessary reductionism inherent in scientific investigation, the commodification, fragmentation, and the reassembling of life into products for exchange, they are all necessary for modern economies. And there have been some bad consequences and collateral damage, people will say. But look at all that has been produced and continues to be produced thanks to the transforming of the new worlds. Ownership, nations, and productive labor are all good and necessary things. The way things have formed is a sign of maturity, they contend. Yet what is at stake here for so many people is a defense of a maturity that is not maturity at all, but, it, but the defense of a vision that has left them with no other path that can look backward and forward. They are forced to minimize the horrors of the past and maximize the accomplishments of the present and live with a highly constrained imagination for what is possible. It is a terrible thing to be with Christians who cannot imagine a different possibility. Those who have become uncomfortable with the question of whiteness also feel as though they have become, we have become obsessed with matters of identity and have lost a sense of common purpose. There is a sense in which whiteness is invisible, not because it cannot be seen, but because the point was never to see it but to, li to live life and perform life toward it. It was only when you resist that performance that you can actually start to see it. But people have always resisted it from the very beginning. People have always resisted the loss of a life and place, resisted being designated racially, resisted their lives being commodified, resisted being forced to live inside a global system of exchange, de debt, and money, and resisted as long as they could the relentless systems of education and evaluation that supported these things. And they did it by drawing on the only tool they had available their identities. So as I close, because I only have two minutes left, Lord have mercy, maybe two and a half, and maybe I can take 20 seconds afterwards. But as I close, what we need at this moment is a Christian faith that can start to break our deep connection to whiteness by resisting its vision of maturity. In the time I have less, all, all I can do is suggest a first step. That's all I can do. But the first step is the most important. The paths that have been formed by whiteness, carved on the earth, and in the bodies that can and, and in bodies, they, these paths cannot be undone, but they can be redirected, drawn into new paths that lead away from death and into life. You see, it all begins with the land. I said it before, it all begins with dirt. 
It begins with air, water, cities, towns, neighborhoods, and homes. It all begins with new kinds of intentional communities that challenge where people live and how people live in places. So as I close, I want to double down on what some people know and feel but are afraid to say. It all comes down, it all comes down to geography and living spaces. Whiteness comes to rest in space. Whiteness always comes to rest in space. The maturity whiteness aims at always forms segregated spaces. It lives, it forms lives lived in parallel, whether separated by miles or inches. It constructs bordered life, life lived in separate endeavors of wish fulfillment. Segregated spaces must be turned toward living spaces where people construct together an everyday that turns life in healthy directions. You see, overcoming whiteness begins by reconfiguring life geographically so that all the flows work differently. The flows of money and education, of support and attention, move across people who have been separated by the processes that have formed us racially, economically, and nationally. We start with the communities that have been left behind in the movement toward maturity. Those no longer imagined through the goals of ownership, citizenship, or productive labor. And we join them, we move to them, we stay in them, we form them, and we advocate for them, or we protect them. We go to the places that people have abandoned, and we start over there. We fight against the segregation that shapes our worlds, and we follow, and we work to weave lives together. Remember, this is only the first step, and there are many more that must follow. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying to you, the point not to be missed, is that we should feel compelled to form what Gerhard Lofing called a long time ago, a contrast society in small places. So I am advocating compelling people to live together across all the lines of formation, all the lines of formation toward whiteness that divide us and have habituated us to be comfortable with those divides. Yes, I want people to move. Yes, I want people to sell homes and move. I want people to move together. Yes, I want to change the geography because that is the only way, that is the only way to move us from this vision, this trajectory toward, toward death. And most importantly, I want to save people from becoming white. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Wow.